I'm Dr. Fekir Ovedi and this is Opportunistic Infections in Adults. Opportunistic infections typically do not affect patients with an intact immune system. So the name opportunistic refers to the fact that these infections take advantage of immunocompromised patients. Immunocompromised patients, not only can, I, can they get opportunistic infections, but they can also have non-opportunistic infections like other people. So infections like UTIs, uh, community acquired pneumonia, skin and soft tissue infections, etc. Which patients are considered immunocompromised? In general, advanced HIV, meaning a CD4 cell count of less than 200, as well as cancer patients receiving chemotherapy that cause myelosuppression, including uh, neutropenia, and those patients who receive immunosuppressant uh, therapy for either autoimmune conditions, as well as those who have received transplant, and that includes both uh, solid organ transplant as well as stem cell transplant. And the one thing that's very important to keep in mind is that use of systemic corticosteroids as a dose equivalent to prednisone uh, 20 milligram per day or more for at least four weeks is considered immunosuppression because that can affect the T cells. And asplenia. So the spleen has the function of filtering the blood. So specifically, any bacteria that's encapsulated will be uh, removed by the spleen. So that includes uh, pneumococcal uh, species as well as Haemophilus influenzae. And asplenia could be either functional asplenia. For example, patients with sickle cell disease will have a non-functioning spleen or if it's anatomical, meaning that it was surgically removed, so splenectomy. In this topic, we will focus on HIV-related opportunistic infections, which are those infections that are most frequent or more severe because of HIV-mediated immunosuppression. Now, in general, for patients who are linked to care and who manifest durable responses to long-term ART, Survivor of patients with HIV infection is currently almost equal to that of individuals without HIV infection. So in general, these are uh, basically becoming rare in patients with HIV because we have very effective ART. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that HIV-related opportunistic infections do not behave clinically exactly like opportunistic infections seen in other immunosuppr uh, immunosuppressed population. For example, uh, when we talk about toxoplasmosis in HIV, toxoplasmosis manifests mainly as encephalitis, whereas uh, in patients with cancer or organ transplant, for example, it's more likely to be like visceral or disseminated disease. Uh, we're also going to talk about pneumocystis pneumonia, which is far more likely in uh, patients with HIV. Yet the same organism often develops uh, indolent disease in other immunosuppressed uh, patients. So here's the problem in uh, advanced HIV. So obviously a normal person has uh, a large amount of CD4 cells. So here on the uh, y-axis, we're looking at uh, concentration of CD4 cell count in the blood. And on the uh, x-axis, we're looking at time. So a normal person has very high number of cells, CD4 cells uh, in the blood. And once this person gets a primary HIV infection, then these CD4 cells start to go down. And then as time goes on, and this is of course without uh, ART, um, these uh, CD4 cells start to go down in time. And then by the time it hits um, you know, less than uh, 350. This is where the risk of some infections go high, including some viral infection like varicella zoster, uh, as well as, uh, you know, other bacterial infections at tuberculosis. So these infections occur more frequently. Now, these are not necessarily opportunistic, but the rate goes up. Now, once you hit uh, the um, uh, 
uh, the 200 mark, so if the CD4 is less than 200, that's when the risk of opportunistic infections becomes real. So this is when you get uh, pneumocystis uh, pneumonia, um, esophageal candidiasis, and then as the CD4 goes even lower, so less than 100, then the number of opportunistic infections goes go up. So you started to have more uh, um, incidents of uh, coxy, uh, crypto, um, as well as um, toxoplasmosis and uh, mycobacterium avium complex. So for someone with CD4 cell count very low, specifically less than 200, uh, the immune system is essentially non-existent. And now imagine a, an HIV patient who starts ART. So if the CD4 count is depleted and then they start ART, then CD4 can, can start to go up. Now that's, this can result in a, a syndrome referred to as IRIS. So IRIS stands for Immune Reconstitution uh, Inflammatory Syndrome. And this basically means that if you start ART and CD4 cell count goes up, then you start to have symptoms of uh, inflammation. And that's because previously, because of the lack of immune, um, you know, lack of an intact immune system, the patients are not capable of having that immune response. So symptoms of inflammation are non-existent. So when you start ART and these symptoms uh, suddenly occur, which sometimes can be very severe, uh, this can be due to two reasons. One is referred to as unmasking iris, which is basically, um, you know, if someone already had an infection, but because there couldn't be an immune response to it, obviously there wouldn't be any symptoms. And um, once you start ART, then those uh, symptoms basically become unmasked. So this is referred to as unmasking iris that you just discovered an infection that was already in the patient. We just didn't know about it because of lack of symptoms. Another one is uh, called uh, paradoxical iris. And this is uh, basically in someone who used to have an infection, but the infection is not necessarily there anymore. But the residual antigens from that previously resolved infection uh, might be circulating in the body. And once you start ART and these CD4 cell counts go up, the body will have a response to it. So these are uh, important to uh, keep in mind in someone with uh, uh, CD4 less than 200. Uh, once we start treatment of opportunistic infections, if you start ART at the same time, uh, for some infection, initially it may look like the patient is getting worse, even though you just started ART. And that's typically not a concern because it's just uh, iris happening. Now I say typically there are uh, you know, situations where the iris can be uh, severe, um, you know, specifically when it comes to CNS infection. So, um, you know, uh, sometimes it might be necessary to actually treat iris with uh, anti-inflammatory agents like corticosteroids. The first learning objective is describe the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of anti-infective agents used for opportunistic infections. So trim sulfa, trimetoprim, uh, sulfamethoxazole combination is by far the most commonly used uh, agent. Uh, there are two brand names for it, Bactrim or Septra, and it's available as PO and IV. Uh, most commonly it is used uh, as PO, the IV formulation. Uh, has very limited stability, so um, you know if you can use PO, PO is used more more often. And uh, the adverse profile, uh, you can see that obviously these happen at, at the same time because uh, trim sulfa is given uh, often as a combination. Trimetoprim is also available as a standalone drug, but more commonly it's used uh, in combination. So trimetoprim component can lead to um, anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, as well as hyperkalemia and uh, hyponatremia. Uh, trimetoprim can also inhibit the secretion of serum creatinine, so it can artificially increase uh, serum creatinine levels without affecting GFR. So that's just an artificial. But the most important is really uh, to keep an eye on the hyperkalemia when it comes to monitoring of trimetoprim.
uh, other um, adverse effects are not really as common for trimethoprim. For sulfamethoxazole, it's a sulfonamide, and for sulfonamide drugs in general, you want to think about skin reactions. So rash is the most common one, and sometimes it can be severe. So Steven Johnson syndrome can happen. Uh, you know, it's it's rare, but it uh, can be fatal. Um, and other skin-related reactions include photosensitivity. And in addition, uh, phonamides can uh, also have GI adverse effects, so nausea, vomiting, uh, and diarrhea. And uh, they can also be nephrotoxicity. So together, uh, trimetoprim and sul uh, sulfamethoxazole, uh, you know, really can cause nephrotoxicity. And this could be a combination of sulfonamide causing nephrotoxicity as well as uh, trimetoprim artificially um, inhibiting the secretion of serum creatinine. Uh, you do need to renally adjust the dose of trim sulfa. So if creatinine class is less than 30, um, half of the dose should be given. Uh, we also have uh, sulfadiazine, which is also sulfonamide. So it's very similar to uh, sulfamethoxazole. And uh, we also have uh, dapsone, uh, which is uh, similar to sulfonamides. Now, dapsone can cause uh, methemoglobinemia and hemolysis, especially in patients with uh, uh, G6 uh, phosphate, uh, glucose 6-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase deficiency. So it is recommended to check, uh, to test patients for uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, and if they have that deficiency, it's best to avoid dapsone. Atovaquone inhibits ATP production by inhibiting the mitochondrial electron uh, transport chain. It is very important to take this uh, uh, atovaquone uh, with food in order to increase absorption. Now we also have uh, a couple of anti-malarial drugs that are used uh, for opportunistic infections, so primaquine and uh, pyrimethamine. And uh, primaquine uh, is actually contraindicated in patients with uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, so it's absolutely essential to uh, test patients for uh, this deficiency before we start. And then um, leucovarine is basically um, um, a folic acid uh, vitamin, which is used in combination with uh, pyrimethamine in order to avoid the adverse effects, specifically hematologic adverse effects of this drug. So leucovarine technically is not an antibiotic. It doesn't do anything to opportunistic infections. It's has to be given with uh, pyrimethamine to uh, basically avoid the severe adverse effects of that drug. And lastly, we have uh, pentamidine, which is also available in an inhalation uh, formulation, but it is not available as an oral uh, formulation. Now let's take a look at some of the antiviral agents used for management of opportunistic infections. And here we're really talking about cytomegalovirus or CMV as the opportunistic viral infection. And because acyclovir, valacyclovir, and famcyclovir are ineffective against CMV, we're not going to talk about them. The most common antiviral agent used for management of CMV is gancyclovir. And gancyclovir is basically a nucleotide analog, so it inhibits a viral DNA synthesis. It has very poor oral bioavailability, so the oral formulation is no longer available in the US. It's primarily used as an intravenous injection. It can also be injected into the eye. Now, valgancyclovir is basically a prodrug of gancyclovir, and this addition of valine group improves oral bioavailability. So it is available as a PO, and it must be taken with food to increase absorption. And once it's absorbed, it's basically converted to gancyclovir. So mechanism of action is identical as well as the adverse effects. Unfortunately, these agents are very toxic. The most important toxicity of these agents is myelosuppression, and this is dose limiting. So patients basically will experience neutropenia um, and thrombocytopenia, so platelets will, will drop. Now fortunately, this is reversible, so within one week of drug cessation, 
uh, neutropenia should be resolved. There's also GI effects so nausea and vomiting, as well as CNS effects, headache, insomnia, and it can be severe. So seizures and coma have also happened in patients, but is not as common. It, they can also cause hepatotoxicity. This is, uh, you know, mild elevation of liver enzymes is not as severe as uh, CNS effects and myelosuppression. Some patients can experience fever, rash, anemia, and peripheral neuropathy. Now, cytofovir is also a nucleotide analog, and it's only available as IV because of uh, poor oral bioavailability. Now, this agent is not causing as much myelosuppression as gansaclovir, but it is extremely nephrotoxic. In fact, it is the most nephrotoxic agent used for CMV. It is so nephrotoxic that initiation of cytofovir therapy is actually contraindicated in patients with existing renal insufficiency. And it must be administered with high doses of probenecid in order to block active tubular secretion and decrease nephrotoxicity. And before each infusion, cytofovir dosage must be adjusted for alteration in creatinine clearance or for the presence of urine protein, and aggressive adjunctive hydration is required. So normal saline would be administered before and after the infusion to reduce nephrotoxicity. Cytofovir can also cause anterior uveitis. So basically, this is inflammation in the uveal layers um, in the eye, and anterior means that this will be in the front of the eye as opposed to in the posterior area. Now let's take a look at phoscarnet. So phoscarnet is an inorganic pyrophosphate analog, so it is not a nucleotide analog, so the mechanism is uh, very different. So, you know, when it comes to cross-resistance, uh, you know, this becomes very important. Uh, but it does inhibit viral DNA synthesis, so the end product uh, is the same. And it also has poor oral bioavailability, so it's only available as IV, and it can be also injected into the eye. It is also very nephrotoxic, so it's um, not as nephrotoxic as cytofovir, but it's very nephrotoxic, so it can cause a lot of electrolyte imbalances. So calcium can either go up or low. So, you know, hyper or hypocalcemia can occur. It just depends. Um, the same with uh, phosphate. So hyper or hypo, whereas magnesium and uh, potassium will often be low. So hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. It can also cause GI effects, so nausea and vomiting, and some CNS effects, uh, including seizures. Uh, some mild elevation of liver enzymes as well as some, uh, you know, anemia, fatigue, rash, and leukopenia. But it's not, the leukopenia is not as severe as myelosuppression caused by gansaclovir and valgansaclovir. Now, because of this severe nephrotoxicity of phoscarnet, saline preloading uh, is also recommended to prevent nephrotoxicity. So normal saline is often given before the infusion. Lastly, we have two new antiviral agents that are active against CMV, so letermovir and meribovir. These two agents are actually not used for treatment of CMV in uh, people living with HIV. Uh, so letermovir is currently FDA approved for prophylaxis in uh, recipients of hematopoietic stem cell transplant and also FDA approved for prophylaxis in adults uh, with uh, kidney transplant. Maribovir is FDA approved for treatment of CMV in uh, patients who are post-transplant with CMV that's refractory to the other antiviral agents. Now, in the future, they may get approved for treatment uh, or prophylaxis of H uh, people living with HIV. So I have listed them here. Letermovir has a different uh, mechanism of action. So it is a DNA terminase uh, complex inhibitor. This is unique to the virus. It is needed for the processing and packaging of viral DNA. And because no mammalian um, cells have uh, this DNA terminase, it has limited adverse effects when it comes to things like myelosuppression. So it is in general well tolerated. 
so it has safety uh, advantage but also because the mechanism of action is different there is no cross resistance with the other antiviral agent it is available as IV and PO and it is uh, well tolerated of course you can have some GI effects like nausea vomiting as well as uh, headache fatigue and tachycardia with Meribavir it inhibits protein kinase uh, UL97 which blocks uh, nuclear uh, egress of viral capsids, which I will explain in a moment what that means. And it is only available as PO. This one also has a different mechanism of action. So cross reactivity uh, is unlikely when it comes to resistance and it is only available as PO and it is well tolerated. Something unique about Meribavir is that it can cause uh, dysgeusia. Uh, which is essentially taste disturbance uh, but you know in general it's not cause for concern for patients discontinuing because of this but this is something to provide education to patients and this is similar to what people experience with Paxlovid for example you may have heard that uh, some patients may have uh, dysgeusia or dysgeusia. Now Meribavir blocks UL97 here so UL97 is needed for the virus to have this process and Meribavir will block that. Now, keep in mind that UL97 is required for gansaclovir to work. So what you don't want to do is to use these two drugs in combination because when you use Meribavir, Meribavir will essentially prevent gansaclovir from being activated by UL97. So here's a comparison of mechanism of action of Meribavir and Letermovir. So once they go inside the cell, uh, Meribavir will plug a UL97, which is needed for phosphorylation of nucleotides that are needed for DNA synthesis. So that will interrupt DNA synthesis. Letermovir, on the other hand, when once it goes into the cell, it will go inside the nucleus and inhibit terminase complex, which is needed for DNA replication. Now there are some other agents listed here that are not available on the market so I'm going to ignore them. Here are the black box warnings uh, for cydophobia. So of course uh, renal impairment and there are recommendations from the FDA uh, to reduce the possibility of nephrotoxicity. Uh, they also have uh, neutropenia as a black box warning as well as carcinogenic and tratogenic and also uh, hypospermia. Uh, in, in men. Some of the contraindications include hypersensitivity, serum creatinine greater than 1.5, cran uh, uh, less than 55, uh, urine protein uh, 100 or more, and use with or within seven days of nephrotoxic agents. And these nephrotoxic agents include uh, things like amphotericin B, aminoglycosides, NSAIDs, uh, and also phoscarnet. You know, there are some uh, situations where multiple antivirals can be used in combination when you know dealing with resistance so you know so there, there may be a situation where uh, cydophobia and foscarnet might be needed to be used together but that's actually contraindicated because of the nephrotoxicity and of course uh, cydophobia should not be injected into the eye uh, because of the toxicity to the eye